once you're using blockchain without knowing that you're using blockchain is when, frankly, the opportunity is over. Yeah. So right now, the more complicated it is for people, which is what I tell them, the fact that this is difficult and hard means that there's an opportunity here. For myself as a business owner and using merchant services, and I'm paying three, four percent merchant fees, now I can take payments via crypto for a fraction of a penny. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm in. So it's a huge opportunity. We're still really, really, really early in this. I've read his newsletters for a long time, and he's someone who is greatly admired in the entrepreneurial world. We were excited to go to Austin to sit down with him and gain insight and wisdom from him. And he's just got a style and a delivery and a way of communication that is extremely powerful and compelling, but also it's just no hype. What you see is what you get. There's great insight here, and it's something that I'm very excited to bring to you. Enjoy my interview with Mike Dillard. Mike, you have such a great reputation. I've really been looking forward to this conversation, so uh, thanks for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. So let's talk about uh, maybe just your entrepreneurial journey and background. How did you get started in being an entrepreneur? Oh, gosh, that goes back to my days in high school mm -hmm. and waiting tables at the original Macaroni Grill in Burlington, oh, wow. Texas. Yeah, uh -huh. which was the same building as the original Rudy's Barbecue. And I used to mountain bike race competitively and... I needed money to fund that, so I'd, I'd bus tables uh, at night during school. Mm -hmm. And I really earned an appreciation for the lack of freedom that comes with having a job. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that I'd miss out on a lot of good times with, with friends on the weekends. And I'd come home at you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, exhausted, smelling like food, and would head back home to my parents' house, turn on television uh, that late at night. And there's really only one thing on at 1 a.m. back in those days, which was infomercials. Uh -huh. <laughs> so watching Tony Robbins and Carlton Sheets and all of those guys, and that really just exposed me to the fact that there was other options available and options without limitations, which really appealed to me. So it was a natural fit, but that was the inspiration and started playing with uh, uh, you know, starting little businesses way back in high school and college, and that's where I got my start. What did you study in college? Uh, <laughs> first semester was biology. Yeah. I was going to be a dentist because at the time my uncle was the most successful, wealthiest person in our family tree. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if I have no other, other interests, that seems like the smartest thing to do. Uh, immediately found out what beer was <laughs> <laughs> when I showed up to the dorm because I never drank in high school since I was cycling. And my first semester, I got a 1-3. <laughs> um, so immediately changed, changed plans and I went to summer school on probation, switched over to marketing, and did well there. But uh, I honestly never went to class. I went to Barnes and & Noble. And I'd sit in the business section reading books on the floor, skipped all of my classes, and then I would go pay 50, 60 bucks to go to the cram sessions You know, three days before. You get all the old tests. Great. And that's what I did for five years until I passed with a 2.0. <laughs> and uh, my theory on that was that I went to class as much as I need to and automate it more. Yeah. Uh, so I already knew I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur, so the degree for me was yeah, kind of pointless. So. What did you do when you got out? So what was your first business venture? First business venture was in the network marketing industry. Mm -hmm. And this is Web 1.0 days. This is early 2000s, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, at the time, this is pre-social media, no YouTube, Facebook, pre-MySpace. Uh, but I had a mentor that had been working with me over the phone for about a year named Stu out in California. And I said, Stu, I'm packing up my truck after I graduate a week later, and I'm coming to learn from you until I figure this out. And how did you was, find Stu? I mean, how did he come into your life? Uh, probably through the network marketing business I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so that's what I did. I packed up my old Chevy truck with everything I owned from my dorm, said goodbye to the folks, drove to California, 
got to San Diego where he was and realized I could not afford anywhere in San Diego. So I kept going to Temecula, mm-hmm. found a $300 a month apartment, uh, had my bed, my desk, and a chair, and that was it. And the living room was full of boxes from my, my memorabilia and college stuff. And that was September 10th, 2001. So the next morning, wow. I got a phone call from mom, freaking out, and that was uh, that was a big change in plans because at the time, if you're selling opportunity, if you're selling hope, if you're selling a brighter, better future, and all of a sudden the world changes overnight, that's not really something that people are in the mood to to talk about at the moment. Right. And so our our plans at, at that time really took a dive, got a job at Best Buy selling computers there in Temecula mm-hmm. for probably three, four months. Couldn't pay the bills at seven bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, whatever I was making, and eventually headed back home to, to Texas. And it was a, a tough lesson learned, but, but interesting timing. And yeah, so that was the first, uh, that was the first venture. So uh, maybe just as a, uh, now with the uh, reflective wisdom after being through this, the, the role of a mentor in the development of being an entrepreneur and the, and the role of timing where things happen. Because you're also mm-hmm. on the heels of the dot-com bubble burst, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that kind of process, then 9-11 happened. So you know, how, how timing might influence your plans. Timing is interesting because it can, it can throw a wrench in a certain set of plans and it can create opportunities in different ways if mm-hmm. you have the skill sets to capitalize on that. And at the time, I didn't have any skills. I was still trying to figure it out. So I don't think at the end of the day, it would have made a difference either way, because mm-hmm. uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But it was, I think the determination was the biggest piece of the puzzle. And I really made up my mind at that point that I was gonna become an entrepreneur. I was basically gonna die trying. Uh, you know, I'd planned when I couldn't make rent or pay my cell phone bill one month. I was like, okay, I can get a gym membership. I can take a shower there. Maybe I can find an air conditioned rental unit, and I'll sleep there, and then I'll figure it out. And that's where my thinking was going. There wasn't any plan B or, you know, idea of quitting, so. So what's interesting is that um, a lot of people might have reacted in that circumstance by saying, uh, well, I guess I'm not meant to do this, you know, the way things unfolded, which mm-hmm. you know, the meant to be thing is, I always find that to be a confusing premise. But, uh, but in, in your case, it was like there was, you weren't dissuaded you know, by the circumstances you were still going to work to go through them. What do you think the compulsion was? I mean, because this is really the heart of an entrepreneur, isn't it? The idea of having a job and giving up on everything I wanted to do in life was infinitely more painful than living in a storage unit. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah, it. That was it. Just that simple. Yeah. So then what unfolded from there? Gosh, moved back to San Antonio, got a job uh, briefly in Dallas recruiting surgeons. This, the biggest piece of advice I ever got was a mentor in that industry at the time. And I'd gone on for five years and failed. Didn't make a dime for five years in a row. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, something's got to change here. And he finally gave me a really good piece of honest advice. And he said, Mike, the reason you're not hitting your financial goals in this industry is because you're not capable of getting the result that you want. You're not that person right now. And you've been chasing these opportunities, if you will. And I put all the responsibility for success on something outside of myself. Mm -hmm. Either it was the business or the product or the marketing materials, but I thought success was gonna come as a result of those things. Mm -hmm. And he had finally dawned on me when he said that. He said, if you want to go make, let's say, $50,000 a month, because that was my big lifelong dream at the time, mm-hmm. he's like, you have to become a person who's capable of achieving that. And he's like, you're not mm-hmm. right now. You're not. You don't have any mastery of any skill sets whatsoever. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. And it was a big light bulb moment for me. So from that point forward, I dove in headfirst into every book I could find on sales, marketing, lead generation and copywriting specifically. I was very shy at the time. I hated talking to people in person and selling. It was just the scariest thing in the world for me to do, even over the, even over the phone. Right. So I learned how to sell via writing, mm-hmm. via copywriting. And it took me about a year, year and a half of just going into every course I could. And I'd sit down at night uh, and print out successful you know, sales presentations and letters from some of the greats like Dan Kennedy or David Ogilvy and, and guys like that. And I would just rewrite them out by hand. And I did that every night for a year, about a year. 
And I learned that skill set. And all of a sudden, I was like, man, I can really sell something here. Mm -hmm. And then I taught myself how to use Google AdWords. And now how do I get eyeballs in front of what I've written? Mm -hmm. And that really changed everything. Uh, I applied that skill to my network marketing business at the time, started recruiting people for the first time ever, built a team pretty quickly of about three or 400 people, mm -hmm. and realized I absolutely hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was like five, six years of pursuing this dream and I finally have it and I figured it out and it was miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't a part of my personality being a really introverted person. Right. So that was another big chapter where it's a um, decision point. Do I give up on this dream of building a business in that industry for six, seven years now or, or do I stick with it? And the solution or the answer that I came up with was, what if I could build this business in a way that I really enjoyed? Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer was that, to that was just, how do I get people to call me instead? Mm -hmm. How do I stop chasing people and how do I get them to, to come after me? And there was just a little twist, you know, at the time to doing that, which is providing value. Mm -hmm. If you put out value into the world, surprise, surprise, you help other people, they want to work with you. And, and essentially, there's this whole attraction marketing philosophy that uh, I happened to introduce to that industry at the time, so this was 2004, 2005. And no one in that world had ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. They'd never heard of online lead generation, they'd never heard of building a business online, they'd never heard of attraction marketing. And I ended up writing this little 50-page training manual for my team at the time that kind of talked about those philosophies and strategies. And all of a sudden I had phone calls from people all over the world saying, hey, can I sell this manual to my team? Can you make one for our team? So I ended up selling it for 40 bucks a copy online. I'd go down to Kinko's, I'd have 300 printed at a time, little cheap spiral bind binding for two, three bucks a piece. Put up a, a sales letter for it, put it on Google, and within, I think, three or four months, I was selling around $50,000 a month worth wow. of that book. And that was an even bigger shift, because now I really felt like I was pursuing my talent and what I was good at, which was teaching, and I'd really discovered that. And so that really turned into an education company where we took the skills which were brand new of online marketing and taught it to that industry. And that turned into an eight-figure business, so. Wow, so uh, it's interesting because it seems like, and maybe this is an important foundation for an entrepreneur, is they have to know themselves uh, mm -hmm. really well to be able to kind of keep moving forward where you said, geez, I got what I wanted and I ended up hating it. So you had, you had to learn things about yourself. Well, in the beginning, you're just like, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, put me in coach and I'll do whatever you say. And that's what I did, you know, for those five years. And I was like, okay, this isn't working <laughs> and I'm miserable. <laughs> What's got to change? And, you know, interestingly, and interestingly enough, that industry is built for people who love networking. They are extroverts. They love meeting people, talking to people. And you stick someone like me in there who shrinks in that environment mm -hmm. and then expect to see success. Yeah. It's an uphill battle for sure, so yeah. So if, if uh, someone were to ask you, so what do you do for a living? How would you describe it? You know, previously I've, I've, I've really just considered myself uh, an educator in the fact that I tend to build companies based on my own personal challenges. Mm -hmm. So whatever my biggest challenge in, is in life, I'll go work on the solution and figuring that out for many years until I do, and then I'll teach other people who have that exact same problem, what I learned. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the heart of what I've done for the last 12 years in two different companies. Now we're, you know, with that, I've been challenging myself in, in new ways to, you know, push myself as an entrepreneur in general uh, outside of that realm, which has been an interesting learning experience yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Well, recently you've been uh, writing a lot of uh, great copy because I've been reading it around uh, cryptocurrency. Mm. What, what got you attracted to that? You know, I don't remember exactly what caught my eye, but I found Bitcoin in 2012. Mm -hmm. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 on Mt. Gox. Mm -hmm. 2012 was a little too sketchy. You'd get on these forums or blogs and, and it would be, send this anonymous person your credit card info and money and they'll send you this Bitcoin back. Yeah. And at that time, you know, it was probably pennies, fractions of a penny. so. Unfortunately, I, <laughs> unfortunately, my radar went off a little too late, uh, but or a little too soon, I should say. But but 2013, I I set up an account on Mt. Gox and bought 500 Bitcoin and, and just was like, hey, 
if nothing happens, great. Vegas money. Right. If something does happen, great. And unfortunately, a year later, uh, my Cox got hacked and I lost all my Bitcoin. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Uh, That's really yeah. unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I paid attention to the industry a little bit. I think I bought back in when Bitcoin was about $700 in 2015, 2016. I don't remember the exact date. And started to notice what was going on with Ethereum as well when it was about five, six dollars. And, and at that point, I really started to dive into that industry in a pretty big way. And I saw, I saw what was going to come from that in the next 10, 15 years pretty quickly. So, Was there something about it sort of uh, you know, either spiritually or philosophically that you said, wow, the idea of a non-government controlled currency mm -hmm. intrigues me. Uh, is, is, is that one of the things that brought you there? Yeah, well, yeah for sure. Um, I was buying gold in 26, uh, 20, you know, 2006, 2007 buying silver, you know, when it was seven dollars, uh, saw the writing on the wall with the financial collapse and, and for anyone who was studying economics and finance at that time, we should have seen the entire thing collapse right. and it took trillions of dollars in money printing to, you know, prop it up and keep it alive. So I've always had a, a bit of distrust around people in power who have control over an unlimited bank account and right. credit card and you know we're the ones who end up paying the bill so yeah yeah so now uh, what is your now that you've seen all the things unfold and it, things continue to unfold it's a fascinating mm -hmm. world the whole cryptocurrency and blockchain world uh, what do you see moving forward what do you think is going to happen you know it's really interesting there's two there's two sides of it there's the, the truly decentralized uh, currencies like Bitcoin that basically cannot be controlled mm -hmm. and the real evangelists, the maximalist, if you will, of that world think that that's going to take over the world and become the de facto global currency. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That'll require mass adoption. So what I've been most interested in following is how our government, specifically the U.S., going to react. Because right. you're not going to see mass adoption if they come out like China did and say crypto and Bitcoin is illegal. Right. You'll get pirates and rebels who will use it, but if you can't buy Starbucks with it, right. it's not going to reach that point. So following what the SEC's done and the policies that they've put out over the last year specifically, uh, they're looking to blend the two. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly how that's going to work out, um, but the genie's out of the bottle at this point. What really excites me the most, I guess, is the, the tokenization of securities and, and real physical assets. I think that's where the real revolution is going to take place here in the coming years when anyone can take their business or house and tokenize the value and pull out the equity. You know, that's going to be game changing. Walk through what that means. So you have a house, you got equity in it. What would it mean to tokenize it? Well, at this point, if you want to essentially raise money, mm -hmm. You, for your business, so let's say, your, your biggest option outside of taking you know, private funding is to take it public, right. which is basically impossible these days unless you're a billion dollar company, right? So uh, that door has been closed and now essentially you're going to be able to take any real asset you have, again, your business, your gas station, your home, your bed and breakfast, whatever it may be, divide it up uh, into shares assign those to a token and then share those on an exchange or let people buy them, invest in them. You can take quarterly profits and automatically distribute those based on a per token basis to everybody's wallet who owns it. And it can be as fast and as simple as that. So basically the token becomes your, your stock or your equity mm -hmm. that you're selling into a public marketplace that people can invest in. Yeah. And now you're, you're, you're starting to cite the whole, well, how's the SEC going to look at this? Because mm -hmm. you know, kind of, there's regulation around securities yeah. and who can offer them and how yeah. they're offered, et cetera. So what's the, uh, the current status of, of that as far as the SEC is concerned? You know, I think it's going to be treated very the same way as stock. Anybody can jump on E-Trade and buy stock right now. Mm -hmm. The difference is what, can, what assets can you turn into stock, mm -hmm. basically, and how easily can you do that? And that's really where, where the big change is going to take place. So uh, lots to figure out yet, but uh, I think that's going to be game changing. Is there an emerging business of uh, people that would say, hey, I'm going to do the picks and shovels of this thing, uh, where I'm going to create the platforms for people to tokenize because, you know, the, the chance person who says, hey, I want to raise some funds and I want to use this vehicle, I mean, you know, what, how, do mm -hmm. they, how do they do it? 
So I, obviously, you know, the, the trading platforms need to be built. Is, is there a, a yeah, movement underfoot to do that? One of your, the guests of this, of this movie, Patrick yeah. Byrne. Yeah. Yeah, and T-Zero. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've been following T-Zero since, since he's announced that. And obviously Patrick and I have a lot in common philosophy-wise mm -hmm. when it comes to money. So I'm very excited about what they're doing. And uh, what role do you want to play moving forward in all this? You know, the role I've taken right now is to help introduce people to what cryptocurrency is about and how to participate safely. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's still the Wild West. Mm -hmm. I still see friends on Facebook, oh my God, my phone was hacked and my wallet was hacked and my Bitcoin's gone. Wow. And these are smart people. These are entrepreneurs. This is not mom and dad, 70 years old, trying to figure this out. And that's just a huge issue right now. So the role I've taken is here's what cryptocurrency is, here's what crypto assets are, here's how they work from a layman's perspective, and most importantly, here's how you store them safely and, and transact safely. You know, even you, you look at the infrastructure we're dealing with right now, and, and outside of Coinbase, you're dealing with MyEtherWallet and, and all of these other tools that, unless you're an engineer, software engineer, or programmer, you, you're going to have a tough time trying to figure out just how to use it. And so right now I'm trying to serve as the guide around that stuff mm -hmm. and, um, and get people involved while the timing's right. So it's still education in essence, yes, right? So absolutely. now just pointing your educational uh, prowess toward this as compared to some of the other things that you've done before. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned that, is that um, I, I got very excited about uh, Bitcoin and crypto when it first came out because mm -hmm. of my own philosophy towards money. And uh, you know, just I just wanted to morally support it and, and hoped it had a future. Uh, but what you say, and this is why it's a real need. I mean, I come from you know, my last business was a technology business, mm -hmm. so I'm not a, I'm not a tech adverse. I'm really tech you know oriented. And when I looked at what it meant to try to purchase Bitcoin, this is back probably when it was trading around six hundred dollars or so. Mm -hmm. I think we, and I, I said I'm going to go get some of this. You know, just just to morally support it, and also I think mm -hmm. it's a cool thing, and I think it might actually do something. We'll see. But by the time I really started to look at what does it take to purchase it, you know, what does it take to have a wallet, what are the risks, how do you have to securitize? For me, it seemed so complex and difficult that I said, I can't imagine adoption at this point because, you know, I'm somebody who's kind of tech oriented and, you know, the average Joe is just not going to be able to weather this. As long as you're expecting people to scan QR codes and copy and paste public keys, yeah. you're not going to see it. Right. And you know, one, of the, one of the projects that I follow is all about putting the, the visual layer, if you will, on top of the blockchain. So everything is in the form of you know, a graphical asset, basically, and you don't see the code anymore. If you want to send someone an asset, you just swipe it or text them you know, this little digital icon, and that's it. And it's a digital asset at that point. It can't be copied, duplicated, and you own it. Um, we're going to see an entirely new world of assets represented with these. It might be a can of Coke at uh, you know, the store downstairs. Well, I, I have one on my phone. Mm -hmm. it represents a real can of Coke. I can go up to the machine. I can you know, make that transfer, and now it comes a real can of Coke, right. and the digital version is gone. And it's going to be really, a really neat future here, but we're just now going through the ideation phase of what it could be. So, And I, and I think that's going to be the tipping point when it gets kind of consumer friendly in that yeah. respect and the adoption I think will be exponential uh, at that point. Yeah, once, you, once you're using blockchain without knowing that you're using blockchain is when, is when frankly, the opportunity is over. Yeah. Um, so right now, the more complicated it is for people, which is what I tell them, the fact that this is difficult and hard means that there's an opportunity here. So, Well, uh, were you surprised um, like when I first was seeing this, that the government stayed passive. Because as you said, the genie's out of the bottle now. I thought the government would try to clamp down on this so quickly because you know, the government control of currency is a major foundation of, of why the government thinks it's, it exists. Right. Um, and then suddenly it, it was out and they were doing nothing. Was that surprising to you? Yes and no. And I've had a lot of conversations with some really smart friends about this because I still don't understand why either. And, you know, so the global crypto market cap, the entire, the entire asset ecosystem around the world is less than $300 billion today. That's around the market cap of Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think they're paying attention to it, or at least they weren't initially because it was just small and a, and a fringe application. But I also 
don't think that they could get anything accomplished quick enough anyway. Does anything move fast in Washington? Yeah. It takes years. Right. And this is moving faster than any other technologies developed. Uh, the adoption is moving faster than anything else. And so I don't, even if they wanted to, I don't think that they would practically be able to make it happen. And so there have been a lot of smart entrepreneurs like Patrick who've been out essentially lobbying and educating Washington and saying, look, this is here. It's not going away. So now we have two options. Do we become the center hub of development and innovation as we were for essentially the first internet applications? Or do we let that go somewhere else to Singapore or South Korea or you know, somewhere else? And I think they're smart enough to know we want the brain power and we want the assets here in the US. So I think that's the way that it's going to go. Certainly a compelling argument, uh, you know, saying, hey, this is out there, and, and now who's going to take the lead? Right. Yeah. Now, what about the wider application of blockchain, you know, beyond you know, a, a currency, but you know, what else it can do in the world? What are you seeing? Uh, well, beyond a currency and around the tokenization of securities, it really is just, it just comes down to people. And there's going to be two different types of applications. There's a truly decentralized application which takes people out of the process. And it's, you know, it's funny, I have, I have a, a rare, very smart entrepreneur friend here in town who is not a fan of Bitcoin or blockchain. And, and he's like, I, I just, I know it's gonna get hacked. I, I know people, someone's gonna come in and, and corrupt it. Mm -hmm. And it just told me that he doesn't really get it because you buy Bitcoin and use crypto because you don't trust people and you don't want people involved <laughs> right. in the process. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, I think the big, the big piece around this is, is Bitcoin is creating a trust-based economy. It's taking inefficiencies that are created in any market by fraud, theft, you know, obfuscation and deceit. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the big transformational piece of this. Uh, you look at, from myself as a business owner and using merchant services, and I'm paying 3 4% you know, merchant fees. Uh, to Amex and Visa and MasterCard and Stripe and everybody else and now I can take payments via crypto for a fraction of a penny. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm in. So it's really going to be interesting to see how those companies start to adopt as well. I know, I know many of them, Visa specifically, has been filing dozens and dozens of patents around cryptocurrency and while at the same time, you know, talking it down and, and all of that stuff as well. So. Well, they, well, smart people, what they do, they're exactly that, they're going to hedge their bets on the threat, right? Yeah. You know, saying, hey, this is you know, nonsense and inappropriate, but at the same time, they're, they, they've got patents. I know that a lot of companies, well, you mentioned Walmart, I think Walmart's got a bunch of patents on crypto, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been interesting to see how people are scrambling right now to, to try to position themselves for this, uh, because it, it is, it's on a tear that I think, you know, it, it's almost uh, dizzying as far as how fast things are unfolding. Yeah, you know, luckily right now, this is the calm before the storm, post-bubble in 2017, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity. We're still really, really, really early in this. Uh, I think we're gonna, it's gonna take another five to 10 years before, you know, 80% of the population is using it like their Visa card. So yeah, we're super early still. And you know, so do you think we're you know in another bubble now? And if there was an economic bubble that was gonna burst, what do you think is gonna happen to cryptocurrency when that you know with that? I think the U.S. Is, stock market is entering a bubble for sure. When you're hitting all new highs every month, every week, mm -hmm. you're in a bubble. Yeah. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see how crypto reacts when that pops. Mm -hmm. Is that money going to go into Bitcoin or is it just going to go into cash and stay there? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I view Bitcoin as digital gold, mm -hmm. as uh, a lot of people do right now. And so, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. And I don't have the answer, but I know I know what I'm betting on. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with with that. Um, do you think because you, you mentioned Bitcoin, do you, what about all I mean, there's I guess over a thousand or thousands yeah. of yeah. Uh, cryptocurrencies now. Uh, do you think the market's over flooded with them and it's oh, going to yeah. be a washout or yeah. what's going to happen there? 95% yeah, of them will be gone in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's great. I think all of the ideas and innovation are necessary. It, it's going to find its, its value in an open marketplace and the winners will stick. But 95% of them will end up just like the dot com days. Mm -hmm. 
The question is now, which do you invest in? Yeah. And unfortunately, just like in the dot-com days, you don't know. So at least my philosophy has been over the last couple of years is to put a little bit, a little bit of money in, in all of them, uh, at least the, the top 50 to 100 that, uh, that are out there. And the big piece for me is, is this going to replace an existing market or business or function that exists right now that has a really large user base? Is this going to allow that to be done faster, easier, and, and more efficiently? There's a lot of applications out there that are brand new ideas. Let's tokenize the dental records industry. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Put a couple hundred bucks in it, maybe a thousand dollars in it, yeah. Vegas money. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, I think all of those are going to go away. At the end of the day, a blockchain is a database, uh, and, and the real value of a blockchain is a distributed one, but most of them are not. They're centralized, right. and at that point, you just need a database. Use Google, use Microsoft, uh, you know, SQL, whatever you want. You don't need a blockchain for it that's distributed and, and being used around the world for that functionality. Well, it's interesting. Um is that typically if you're like looking to uh, to invest in equities or even to speculate into markets, there's some fundamentals. You know, well, like if you're going to the dot com, you know, pre bubble, mm-hmm. you'd say, okay, well, who are the who's the team, right. <laughs> right? That you know that's doing this. You know, oh, Jeff Bezos, he, well, he's 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 running Amazon. I kind of think he's got his act together. Blah, blah. You know, you have certain yeah. things to grab onto to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this this research to make my investment here. It's, it's a little bit more abstract, right, as far as, uh, you know, how do I pick which coins? You know, 90% of the, the websites I've seen for these applications, and I'm somewhat educated around this space. I'm, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, I gave myself a solid 4 or 5. Mm-hmm. But I'm not on the engineering side. Mm-hmm. But you go to the website, and it's just all of this tech mm-hmm. jargon. And that tells me that they're not in touch with, solving a mass consumer problem they're in touch with building something that they think is really cool right and that's not really an asset that i want to invest in so well so uh now if uh, people are out there saying okay i'm not a sophisticated investor um but uh you know i i kind of do the traditional stuff uh but this is interesting to me what's the path they would take uh, to try to you know say okay i need to get up to speed to be able to properly invest here yeah, you know, buying it today is easier than ever. Uh, there's the Cash App, there's Coinbase, which is super easy. And so I think that's becoming more and more accessible. At this point, it's how do you use it safely? Mm-hmm. So there are just a, you know, a lot of sophisticated scams out there where even if you take some really good security steps and you set up two-factor authentication on your phone, mm-hmm. uh, but if you do it via SMS text, let's say, where you get a text back, and you have to enter in your, your code, right, to verify your, your login. There are employees at these phone companies that are paid for and bought by the crooks. Wow. And they'll switch out your, your SIM card, give your number, you know, control of your phone number to the crook for five, ten minutes in order for them to get that authentication number, switch it back, and you wake up and your crypto's gone. Um, and there's no way to recover it at that point, is no. there? No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So... You know, there are just pieces around, around like that that people need to get educated on. We're seeing the big, the big next wave here is going to be with the introduction of essentially, you know, Wall Street uh, institutions into this industry. We're seeing, we're seeing BACT launch this year. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing the... What is that? Uh, BACT is a joint venture, I believe, between Microsoft and, and a couple of other really large Fortune 500 companies to bring institutional level infrastructure to crypto. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is insurance, Mm -hmm. right? So nobody's gonna put in pension fund money into anywhere Mm -hmm. if it's not gonna be insured against theft. Right. And so all of those pieces of infrastructure are being put in place right now this year. And I think once those come online and they get approval from the SEC, that's when you see this turn into dot com. Yeah you know, dot-com days in a really big way. And for me, this industry, and I just tell people straight up, it's speculation. Mm-hmm. We are speculating, we're gambling, and our odds are really, really good. But at the same time, more than anything else, you have to have an exit plan mm-hmm. uh, on what you're going to do with your potential gains. If we see another 100x move, what are you going to do with that money? And I think that's a really important question to ask as well. 
Uh, and it's just also really important for people to understand that this is unbelievably risky right now. Yeah. It is super early. And so making sure that you don't invest money that you can't afford to lose is a huge, huge part of this. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, learned that lesson in 2017. Yeah. You know, so. So uh, for you, um, d do you see yourself focusing mostly in this area for the foreseeable future as far as your business activities? No. Um, you know, the, the focus for me really remains around entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I think that's my, my biggest point of value and what I can offer people because that's where I've learned the most lessons during my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I think making people aware of crypto and the basics is a role that I can play, but it's not, it's not my field. Um, I, think, I think I have a, a talent for taking complex subjects and communicating them to other people in a simple manner, mm -hmm. which is helpful in, you know, to a large group of people, but that's, that's my role. So, uh, well, let's go back to that for a moment because uh, you, know, you almost became a dentist, <laughs> or at least right. had an interest early on because, as you said, the, 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 the most wealthy person in your family tree was a dentist. Let's say somebody actually went and did that, and now they've, they've practiced for 25, 30 years, and they said, I can't do another decade or two of this. Uh, I want to become an entrepreneur. You know, I, I, I've saved some money, so I'm not like you know, starving and going to live in a locker, but, you know, uh, but I, I now want to make a move. What do you think, in today's world, the best move is for somebody like that? You know, it comes back to skill sets. Mm -hmm. It comes back to, it's not about your idea. It's not about how much money you can plow into it. Mm -hmm. It's about your skill set. And for me, the primary skill set is on the, the sales side. Mm -hmm. You can have a phenomenal product. You can be a world-class engineer. If you can't sell either your, you know, your backers from an investment standpoint or your team from a hiring standpoint or at the end of the day, your customers, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. So my biggest piece of advice around that is understand what your skill set is and how that can be applied in a way that will help grow a business and generate revenue. Mm -hmm. Revenue is the lifeblood of a business. Mm -hmm. if business gets unbelievably stressful if money's not coming in the door, yeah. especially if you start to build a team and um, you know, your expenses get up there. So that to me is skill set number one. Until you have that, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Go learn how to sell, how to, how to market, how to generate leads, how to generate traffic. Once you can do that, the world's your oyster. You can do anything because right. you can apply that skill set to absolutely anything in any industry that inspires you. And that's really the key to, to success these days. And I don't uh, know of a single entrepreneur who has had success without learning that and acquiring that skill set either at one point or another. It really has served as the foundation for all of us. So, Do you have uh, dispositions toward you know, real estate versus buying a franchise versus uh, you know, trading the market? Uh... You know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is when I was young, I always remember asking myself, where is the greatest point of leverage? Mm -hmm. And what would that mean when you say greatest point of leverage? Yeah, where's the greatest point of leverage? Where's my goal? And so back in the network marketing industry, this is what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm a distributor, and I'm building maybe a, a network of people who might consume the products or might sell them as well, but my point of leverage is their activity and their consumption. Mm -hmm. So I might have a group of three or 400, 500 people below me who are buying products or maybe they're building a business as well, but that's my point of leverage off of their activity. Mm -hmm. What's the next level up of leverage? Uh, it's the, uh, the company owner, mm -hmm. right? They're getting paid on everybody's activity and consumption. Mm -hmm. well, where's the next point of leverage from there? Well, maybe it's as a software company that is serving all of the network marketing companies. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's providing merchant services to them, maybe it's providing you know, customer management software, accounting software, whatever it may be. Where's the next point of leverage up from that software company? Well, it's probably the bank who's providing them liquidity and funding, right? Mm -hmm. So same with real estate. If you were gonna get into real estate today, you're probably gonna start out as a broker. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you're just a really ambitious, highly worked, highly, hopefully paid salesperson. Okay you know, working from transaction to transaction. Next point of leverage up, and it's the person who owns the brokerage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look at the real estate industry, and if you're starting out, maybe you're gonna be an agent, mm -hmm. and you're gonna go sell homes, and at that point, you're a really hardworking salesperson, mm -hmm. but there's no leverage. So, what's the next level up? Well, maybe you own the brokerage that has 10 agents. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, you look at Keller Williams, 
and you know what they're doing, multi-billion dollar real estate company, I think top three in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've had lunch with Gary a couple of times and, and Gary's in a great point of leverage. He's got 150,000, 200,000 agents underneath him basically making him money every day. Mm -hmm. And so after that, where's the greatest point of leverage? Again, it's the banking system. It's providing the mortgages and the loans for all of these homes that are being sold. So the question that I would ask yourself whenever you're thinking about starting a business, you're not going to be able to start at that top, at that greatest point of leverage, but what, what is it? And at least think about it. Right. And to me, that would be my goal, uh, is to one day end up there at that point, because that's the difference between making you know, $250,000 a year and $250 million a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at least be aware of it and, and look for it. So leverage basically be defined as getting things done through other people. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, and I think that, that was a great stair-stepping example saying, hey, if you're the salesperson, you're, you're hustling all the time and you're just, you eat what you kill. <laughs> yep. uh, as compared to saying, now I got other people hunting for me. Right. And, uh, and they all feed a piece up to, uh, you know, up, upstream. And those are two different skill sets. Making that transition is, has been the hardest one for me to make, and it mm -hmm. typically is for most entrepreneurs. The skills that'll allow you to make your first million dollars, mm -hmm. essentially sales, mm -hmm. is completely different when all of a sudden you can no longer sell and you've got a team of 10, 12 people that now have to take over that role and responsibility. Because you developed a lot of skill and talent and nuance mm -hmm. when it came to producing the results that you did. And all of a sudden, you've got to say, okay, I can't do that anymore. I've got to teach these, these other group of people how to take that over. That's a huge transition. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's starting over in many ways for, for an entrepreneur. What, uh, what books uh, or any kind of media have influenced you most that you think you found most beneficial to your life? You know, the traditional think and grow rich, mm -hmm. how to win friends and influence people way back in the day. That's what I was reading in college on the floor at Barnes & Nobles. <laughs> and... You know, out of, out of, after that, there's a lot of great books from Dan Kennedy on direct response marketing. I think Dan's a great teacher and, and his principles are applicable to any industry. After that, it really has just transitioned into to leverage and, and scaling. From a philosoph philosophical standpoint, obviously Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, uh, that's been a, a huge inspiration in my life. And it was really interesting, specifically in 2007, 2008, having read that book and watched watching what was happening around the world, it was almost as if it was, like it was a prophecy. straight out of the pages. <laughs> right. And it's still happening. Yeah. Um, you know, Rocket Fuel is, from a scaling standpoint, a phenomenal little book to help you as an entrepreneur make that transition and get to a point of essentially working on your business instead of in it. Mm -hmm. um, the E-Myth is where that line came from. Yeah. So my home is filled with hundreds of books. I'd say I've probably read half of them. The <laughs> others the others are still on the to-do list. Right. And are you finding you know, that there's uh, a lot of blogs that maybe are beneficial to as compared to just books, but there's other forms of, of content out there that you can go get? You know, interestingly enough, I think that's the biggest challenge young entrepreneurs have today is they're growing up with Instagram and 15 second story videos and five minute videos on YouTube and Twitter and blog posts. And it's more information than ever mm -hmm. with less value than ever. Mm -hmm. And for me, I found that success is in the details. I found that if I will focus on acquiring a piece of knowledge or a skill that I spend a year on mm -hmm. and maybe read five books on or three ring binders on or go to conferences on, and I get down to a level where I'm debating which word I should use out of a document that has 10,000 words because I know that word is going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between success and not. And I don't think specifically young entrepreneurs these days really understand that. And so they wonder why they're watching hours of content a day and still not accomplishing anything. So for me, I view it as a as a negative in many ways, especially if you're just starting out, you're much better served reading a book that's 200, 300 pages long from end to end. Mm -hmm. You're gonna come out of that with a real set of understanding and skills rather than you know a 10 page blog post. Yeah, yeah and I, I, that's what I've noticed is that depth is important and, and it's, it's that extra little 
few percent of, of knowledge that is the tipping point as yeah. to success versus failure. That's what separates you, you know, as an expert as compared to somebody who's kind of an amateur. Um, success is in the details. Yeah, it really yeah. is. So uh, I'm, a, I'm uh, an admirer of self-made man mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. I think we, uh, we share some of the common roots in our, our philosophies and what's influenced us. And uh, so just the title caught me when I saw Self-Made Man. I mm -hmm. actually own that, that sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about it and, and where you're going with it. You know, Self-Made Man was inspired at a Tony Robbins event. Uh, I went to a date with Destiny in 2014. And I was at a transition point in my career in my life where I'd built two successful companies and I needed a new challenge. Um, and I wasn't sure exactly what to do yet, but I, I knew of two problems that I was aware of that I thought I could solve. One was in the uh, food production industry, and this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but I live right across the street from the headquarters of Whole Foods here in Austin, Texas, and shopped in the produce section every day. I do a lot of juicing, and if you do some juicing at Whole Foods, you're walking out with $60, $70 worth of produce. Yeah. It's not cheap. and it really bothered me that you have to be fairly wealthy in the United States just to buy food that is not covered in poison. Right. And I thought that was really screwed up. So I had an idea to essentially solve that problem. And I wanted to put clean organic food in everybody's home at a price they could afford. Mm -hmm. So I actually went out and bought a bunch of books on hydroponics on Amazon mm -hmm. and uh, started to make notes and come up with ideas on how to solve this and fairly simply put it had to produce enough food for you and your family on a, a monthly basis that would replace your run to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Had to be easy so that everybody could use it. You don't have to have any knowledge of plants and it had to be pretty because it's going to be in your house. Mm -hmm. So I've never developed a physical product, never really grown anything, definitely not dove into tech or hydroponics. So it started on Amazon with a few books and a few phone calls to some industrial design firms and I had a little mock-up made on Photoshop on Odesk. I paid a guy 200 bucks to take this idea and make a little photo of it. And a couple of months later, we signed on with a phenomenal firm in Silicon Valley and we're gonna make the first automated farm for your house that'll grow all of your food. And the idea is how do we decentralize the ag industry? Mm -hmm. Because if you get rid of the farm and the farmer and the tractor and the 18 wheelers and the thousand miles of highway or the massive tankers that float from continent to continent, and if you get rid of the pesticides and the distribution centers and finally the retail center, guess what? Your food goes down 90%. You get rid of 100% of the pesticides and the pollution. And everything starts and ends in your, in your kitchen. Uh, but no one had really ever done that before on a consumer level space. Mm -hmm. You can find little countertop systems you can use to grow some basil or mint, but that was about it. Right. So we built it. We built it about two and a half years. We built a system that would grow about $4,000 a year worth of food and for 400 bucks. Wow. And fully automated, you just drop in the seed and the lights take care of everything else and the nutrients and the dosing and the pH balancing and all of that. And it was phenomenal. but it. Uh, almost bankrupted me. <laughs> so, so that was a big lesson learned because I funded all of it. And right as we were getting to a point where, okay, we've got a prototype working, what do we do next? This was my lesson learned in lack of skill set in this industry. Uh, you know, how much longer is this going to take? Well, probably through safety testing, development, package design, you know, service centers, another two years, another two or three million bucks. It's like, oh, because when we first started this, you know, the budget was $500,000, at least that was the estimate. Mm -hmm. We were way beyond that at that point. And so I hit a point where I essentially had to go raise money or pull the plug on it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up talking to a mentor of mine and asking him for advice. And he said, look for a win or a way to win in this, even though it might not look like the initial road that you had intended. Mm -hmm. Can you do anything with your competitors? And so I called up a competing company who had just launched a phenomenal line of products that were like ours. They were had a Y Combinator, had a ton of money, mm -hmm. big team, and I ended up investing in them. Mm -hmm. And I pulled the plug on, on Evergrow, which was the company at the time. And the backup plan after that was Self Made Man. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that I took away from Tony's event was the fact that I've seen, at least to 
huge decay in the value system here in the United States from Washington and Wall Street on down. Now it's get the result you want at any cost, whether you have to lie, cheat, or steal. And there was not a lot of pride being taken in craftsmanship and quality and work ethic. It was just, where's my money? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was going to lead to a really nasty place here in the U.S. a generation from now. You look at how many young men specifically are growing up without dads and role models. Mm -hmm. Really bad situation. Uh, straight out of the shrugged again. Right. So the backup plan was how can we elicit change on a society level uh, you know, paradigm essentially over a generation or two. And looking back in history, I've really only found that there's two ways to do that. Mm -hmm. It's through the barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. as many dictators have done, or it's by indoctrinating the kids and the next generation with a different value set. Right. So obviously for me, I went that route. And the goal for Self Made Man is to really provide young men with mentors and leadership and an education set and a philosophy of life that will uh, you know, lead them to become really productive, honest members of society. And that was the goal. And it really took on a life of its own. How long has it been out there now? We launched the podcast in the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And that's really all it was at the time. I'm going to do a weekly show with amazing people. Mm -hmm. And then this year, 2018, we launched the education platform that we've been building. And essentially, it's an online school. Mm -hmm. For, for young men with ambition. It's basically the audience that we, we are targeting. Or if you're 18, frankly, to 40, and you have ambition and you want to achieve something more in life, we want to provide you with the mentorship and the knowledge you need to accomplish that. So, so is the way, uh, just go to selfmademan.com and people can you mm -hmm. know, uh, find the podcast and other materials there? Yeah. How rewarding has this been for you? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be getting just a little message from, from someone who is like, man, you're just listening to the podcast sent me down a new direction in life and here's where I was before and here's where I am today. Yeah. And that's really my goal is, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a pretty vivid dream recently where there was a bunch of pictures of families on the wall that I was looking at and they were all super happy and stoked and, and feeling uh, just like they're where they were meant to be. And those were all of the families whose lives essentially had changed direction because they were exposed to what we're building. And so for me, that, that's you know, what I'm after. So after all these years now that you've put into your entrepreneurial career, um, are you finding growth in your fulfillment? Uh, are you finding that's waning or that there's burnout? How are you feeling about it all now? You know, the longer I pursue my career as an entrepreneur, the more I realize I don't know. And Evergrow is a perfect lesson for that where I like to call I paid a really high stupid tax. <laughs> yeah. and you pay the tax and you're going to pay the tax in one form or another. You're either going to pay it because you're going to go out and buy courses in education and acquire the knowledge you need to pursue what you're building or you're going to pay it in the form of mistakes, time and money lost. There's no avoiding it, but one choice is better than the other. Yeah. And so, you know, the more I challenge myself, the, the more lessons I learn and, and I've still got a hell of a long way to go. So, yeah, yeah I, one of my uh, premises or saying, sayings around this is that the great thing about entrepreneurs is that they fall in love with their ideas. Mm. But the problem with entrepreneurs is that they fall in love with their yeah. ideas. Yeah, that was a big part of Evergrow, yeah. was learning that and, and getting a lot of pieces, of pieces of wisdom around that from others who'd gone through that. And thankfully, I was, I was willing to listen to them. So we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Uh, it's been uh, really, really stimulating. Uh, any final thoughts? You know, the biggest, the biggest lessons I've learned, again, are if you're stuck and you want to become unstuck and make progress, go master a new skill set to the point where you can write a book on it, mm -hmm. the point where you can provide that service or skill set to other people, you know, as a, as a service provider. At that point, you can open so many doors, but as long as you keep reading about that and not doing it, you're going to stay where you're at. Second piece of advice would be to really master your emotions when it comes to money, because making money and keeping money are two very different skill sets, yeah. and that's another, another lesson I've had to learn through my career as well. So start to study that now. Start to assume that you've got a million dollars in the bank and start to make a plan for it and to decide how you're going to use it. Uh, and then finally, 
when you have an idea for a solution that can help a lot of people, once again, look for that greatest point of leverage. Mm -hmm. And know from day one that in order to ascend to that point, it's going to be all about people. It's going to have to, your skill set is going to have to change from creating or selling your product to building a team mm -hmm. and, and really growing a great group of people and becoming a leader. And just keep that in mind as well. Great advice, great wisdom. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to sit and share it with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.